Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's good to see you here. Um, I'm a banker in the middle of you know, this energy of fintechs, of entrepreneurs, of innovators. I'm a banker that probably, you know, most of the bankers would feel an endangered species here, right? Uh, and I think that some of the bankers should be feel threatened by what's happening here. They should feel threatened by what's happening here. If you just go to what uh, you know, some of the researchers tell us, McKinsey's and the Accenture's, and they tell us what is the revenue at stake for banks because of everything that's happening in the fintech world, they indicate that we, are, that we stand to lose 35 to 40% of all of our revenues. And honestly, I do think that banks can do a much better job in order to service their customers. I'm convinced of it. When I was prepare, preparing for our Think Forward strategy three years ago, we went out and did a customer survey. And actually, our customers were quite honest with us, because they said, you know, clearly in the future, we need banking. But honestly, would I need a bank? And for a banker in front of you, that's quite a sobering thought. It's actually quite a confrontational feedback that you get from your own customers, our customers. And that's not the only thing that banks are up against. Clearly, you know, and that would set us apart from what you can do as, as fintechs, as innovators. It is that we also have this burden of regulatory change coming at us that we have to comply with. And for the right reasons, maybe, on the back of the crisis. We'll have to cope with it. So there's a lot going on for banks and a lot of going on for bankers as a consequence of which they feel threatened. And honestly, I do think that banks have an existential choice to make. And you've heard about the analogy of, you know, focusing on assets versus access. I have a different one here, which is, do you want, as a bank, to become the train track or the train? The train track, which is, do you want to become an efficient balance sheet manager? Do you want to become an efficient processor? Do you believe in white labeling of your products? Is the only focus to be a low-cost producer? Don't you mind being disintermediated by aggregators, by comparison sites? It's the way to go. If you go in that direction, you will generate capital, you will repay that capital to your shareholders, you won't grow. That's okay, it's a choice. It's a choice to be made. Or do you want to be the train? The train where the experience happens? The train where people sit in? Is it on time? Is it a good service? And that's where I think we focus as ING. We have decided that we want to be the train. How do you make sure that you deliver a differentiating strategy, uh, experience for your customers? And that's where a lot of the things come in, like innovation. So when we started to develop our strategy three years ago, actually we, would, we went back to the essence of ING, and basically we went back to the purpose of ING. And the purpose of ING is to empower people to stay a step ahead, a step ahead in life and in business. Now you see there's no word of banking in this one. But how do you make sure that you empower people, basically people who can do things themselves, how do you make sure you do it in such a way that they stay a step ahead, so that they know things better, that they feel in control, that they can make the decisions themselves, both in life and in business? So whether it's in the consumer area or in the business area. That's the purpose. And it's not about banking. We do it in many different ways. And that is connected directly, therefore, Directly, we derived our customer promise to make banking easy, which is not easy. And by now, probably you have seen and you have also experienced, some of you, that you know, some of the stuff with technology can be made easy, but then you may get into an area where a lot of regulatory pressure is coming, and then you can't make it easy. So making banking easy, being available anytime, anywhere, and empower your customers with one pivotal part of the strategy. How do you deliver a differentiating experience to your clients? 
Now, in the digital era, to deliver that differentiating experience to your clients, you have to focus on the primary relationship, which is in our strategy. But the question really is, if you come from old-fashioned banking, where everything revolves around the branch and the branch manager, knowing the client, how do you make sure that you can actually be relevant to your client, that you understand your client, that you understand the needs of your client, that you know when there is a need with your client? And that's where digital comes in. Because you see that the number of contacts with our clients has only increased. So the number of contacts with our clients vis-a-vis -vis an old-fashioned bank with branches has only increased. So there's a lot of opportunity here to understand your clients better because it, they come to you all the time. But if you really want to use this, you have to invest in digital. You have to be a digital bank. And you have to innovate. Now, and here we come. If we're talking about innovation, if we're talking about flexibility, if we're talking about agility, the word bang doesn't come to mind, does it? And nevertheless, this is what we're managing. A bang, probably you would think as a tanker, an oil tanker, of which the captain, being myself, thinking about the course to go, given direction, and then slowly but surely you would see it going one way or the other. So how do you become that bank that is innovative? How do you become that bank that is flexible and agile? Do you have it in you? Can you be it? Now, this is a picture I prefer. Running around on the tracks with you, being a little bit bigger, but just as agile, just as flexible. The point is, I actually think I can. And sometimes in life, you need external confirmation of what you are and what your DNA is. Because if it comes to innovation, if it comes to agility, when developing the strategy, I was visiting Silicon Valley a couple of times. And I was invited by five CEOs, some of your colleagues, and they may even be here, invited me for dinner in the valley. And I was thinking, OK, there's only one question I want to ask these guys, CEOs of startups. How, and my question was really, how do you make sure that from the startup, how do you become a sustainable business? How do you scale up? And how do you become a sustainable player? That was my, lead, my, my major question before I would invest in new technology and innovation. And the funny thing is that all five CEOs that were there with me said, well, that's exactly why we wanted to talk to you. I said, well, me, a banker? I said, yeah, you, ING. Because you are the only company in the world that has actually been able to scale up from being a startup to a scale up to a sustainable bank. And not only that, in one country, you have been able to replicate that model in many other countries as well with ING Direct. And then you start thinking, hey, these guys are right. It's in, it's in our DNA. So we should be able to take this to the next level. We should be able to cope with some of the challenges that we now see. We should be able to reap the opportunity that new technology brings in order to stay true to our promise to the client and our purpose. Now, so innovation, we can do. And when I started, the first thing I did is I appointed a chief innovation officer. OK, so we have a chief innovation officer. Wow, that's the big change. Everybody does that, right? But we started boot camps, internal boot camps. And I went out to all of the countries. We're in 43 countries, a lot of traveling. And it asked all of my guys and ladies, take a day out of your week 
come up with your best idea, send it in, and we'll see. Now, we have just finished our third boot camp in two and a half years. Overall, we have more than 3,000 ideas, and clearly, after that, you funnel it, and new services keep popping up. So there's a lot of innovation, right, in our organization. There's a lot of ideas and entrepreneurship in our organization that we can actually benefit from. And we use accelerators, we use our own uh, way to innovate, to get it from an idea to a business case, to prototypes, all of the things that you're doing as well. We have an innovation fund to support that as well. And new ideas keep, keep coming. So I've, I have innovation going on now. But now the question is, where's the flexibility? And where's the agility? So how, what do you do with your structure? And what do you do with your culture? Because Everybody can think of something nice, and even we could make a business case out of it. We could even invest it, but how do we make it a success? And how do we make sure that this continues? So you have to change the structure as well. One of the biggest structural changes we made in the organization is right in the Netherlands, the oldest part of RNG. And we turned the organization completely upside down. Completely upside down. Which means from an hierarchical structure with marketing, product development, operations, IT, we've moved to work in tribes and squads. Tribes as the way, as the parts that have the knowledge. But the squads that work in teams for three months, in sprints, to improve what we do, to take ideas from one point to the other, and to fail fast as well. Fail fast in a bank, making mistakes. Haven't we learned anything about, uh, after the crisis? And this is a real challenge now. How do I make people understand that I don't mind them making mistakes? And clearly in a bank, there is zero tolerance areas. I mean, Western Union knows, we know what it takes to onboard clients and do all your checking. What, it is, what is necessary to make sure that you're not used for money laundering and all of that. Really, this is a zero tolerance area for all of us. So no mistakes to be made in those areas. But in other areas, we want people to test, to experiment, and to fail, because failure is learning. So next to the innovation and the structural change, you also need a cultural change. Now, if this is what I can do and put it all together, then still the question is, can I actually start changing the things we do? And for that, we have to go back to our DNA. And in our DNA, as I said, and I already mentioned, we have the ING Direct. And we just go back to the learnings of ING Direct. When we set up ING Direct, and this is 20 years ago, if we had ING Direct now, we would probably call it a fintech, right? It wasn't a word back then, but it's probably the fintech avant la lettre. 20 years ago, we started it. We thought we had a good idea, but we also knew that a good idea should not be killed by an old business. So the first thing that we did is, OK, this is a startup, so it should not report low in the organization, where it will be killed, but high up in the organization, reporting directly to a board member. That's ingredient number one. Ingredient number two, you put them in a different location. Don't put them in your head office, where they will be governed the way the bank is governed, where they will be cluttered with bureaucracy where basically every dimension of energy that you can generate will be killed before it even comes up. So those were the ingredients to make it a successful startup. And also make sure that you agree on the strategy. And in order to really test whether we had the right model, we also agreed that we should not go into the markets in which it would cannibalize our business. 
That's 20 years ago. These days, I'm preaching that we should direct, disrupt ourselves before others disrupt us, because there are so many of you, right? But back then, if you wanted that deal to succeed, that startup to su succeed, and really test whether you had the right model, try it in a different market. Because you know, and I think it was John Hagel who mentioned it, and some of you will know him from the Singularity University, he said, well, these big organizations have an immune system for new ideas. They support it until it becomes something real, and then they kill it. That's why we set it up like that. But that's not the only part of the success. This was also a true purpose-driven organization. So if you want to be successful out there, have a purpose. And that's not making money. You will make, mo make money if you're successful, but that's not a purpose. Our purpose is like the ING purpose, was truly how can we do a much better job for our clients, hassle-free banking. Hassle-free banking. And we had people with a completely different mindset. We selected people with a completely different mindset to make sure that they believed in, you know, we are the good guys. That was literally one of the internal slo slogans. We are the good guys, right? And that's how it evolved, culture and purpose. But even that was not successful to make, uh, enough to make it a success. You need more. You need a business model that disrupts. So we looked at the internet and we said, how can we do online banking availability 24-7, no fees? Clearly, this is all recognizable now. I'm talking 20 years ago. The internet was not even known to many people, let alone mobile. And that's how we disrupted. That was, that, those were the conditions to make it a successful startup. But those were not the conditions to make it a successful scale up. Because when the startup became successful, and I think this is one of the question marks that you, know, you should be working on, and that, you know, I got confronted with the CEOs asking me, rather than me asking these CEOs in Silicon Valley, is that how do you scale it? And honestly, that's where a difference came in. And that's where we needed to go on to the larger organization. Because when you scale it and you replicate it in different uh, markets, Basically, one of the th things that we agreed is if you want to be a low-cost pro uh, producer and if you want to be a disruptor in those markets, make sure that you replicate and standardize across. Collaboration is of crucial importance if you want to build scale. You have to copy each other's best practices rather than reinvent the wheel all the time. It will be too costly and you will be too slow, certainly in today's markets. So standardization and collaboration were in, uh, important ingredients for the scale-up. But we also needed real, um, real marketing knowledge. Because if you scale up, people should know about your existence. And certainly in those times, there were no social media. So everything needed to be done through what we call guerrilla marketing. And that knowledge, we had in ING. So that's the knowledge we brought to ING Direct. And for that, you also need a lot of money, by the way at those times. And clearly, in the scale-up phase, if you think the startup phase is expensive, the scale-up phase is even more expensive. Clearly, also there, you know, the mother company provided the deep pockets needed in order to develop. So what I'm saying here is that, clearly, as a startup, it's interesting, and you need to be purpose-driven, and you really should be serious about what it is that you want to bring to the world as something new because otherwise it will not work. On the other side, if you scale up, basically we feel and we felt, and it's our experience, that it's good to partner up with a larger organization. And that brings me to how I think we can work with you. I don't believe in the story of, you know, you know enemies or true competitors or whatsoever. Clearly we compete, clearly we compete here and there. And I'm also not a venture capital firm. 
I don't provide for venture capital. I'm a bank. But where I think we can work and where, where we can make a success is in the scale up to cooperate. There's a lot of things going on out there, and there's a lot of initiatives and a lot of fintechs that we're interested in to work with. And we already have established more than 40 partnerships, and some of those you see here, and Cabbage is one of the more successful ones, and Rob is right there, I see. Um, that's a very successful uh, cooperation that we have right there, where Cabbage actually provides something that we don't have. But what we have is the market access in geographies that they don't know very well. We have a brand in those markets and the scale in those markets to really test how he can scale up in a market that he doesn't know very well. And that's how these corporations work. Also, in order to make sure you know, that we know what's going on in the market, we have appointed the head of FinTech, Benoit Legrand. He's walking around here as well. He's looking at you know, fintechs that can help us you know, managing the payments area, the money management area, the um, instant lending area, uh, the customer onboarding area, because this is a very important one. And you will hear that from everyone, PayPal and everyone. If you want to be successful in Europe, the market is rather small, because the market is a country by country market, and every country have their own kind of regulations and their own laws that you have to comply with. So before you can really scale in Europe, the question is, where do you start? You should start in a larger market, but even the largest market in Europe is not as large as the US market. So what we are really lobbying for as ING in Brussels is how can we make sure that onboarding um, can be standardized across many of the different countries so that we can create one market. We're lobbying for what we call the e-identity, the, the, the digital identity for consumers, which would, all, which would help us all. So in short, the way I think we can truly work together is where you have the ideas, where you have the proven concepts that can truly help differentiating the experience for our clients in those areas, I think we have a very good base for a working relationship. I think of us as David and Goliath. The startup is small. In the scale up, you need to partner for the capital, for the customer reach, for the brand for the consumers to know the markets. And one, although bigger, cannot be successful without the other. That's what I believe in, and that's where I think there will be a win, win, win. A win for you, a win for the bank, but the most important one is a win for the customer, because we're all doing it for the customer. Thanks very much.